This is part two of a video which describes a methodology for the design of a jammer for ship defense against drone attack, where I'm using the word design very loosely here, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, for illustration, the drone is a surface drone which is uh, guided by an operator using a video feed provided by the drone. So this is not a video about the design of an electronics package for uh, a jammer. Let's assume that a vendor somewhere has produce, produced a, a suitable package which is able to, in quotation marks, jam a drone. Um, yeah, so we, we only want to find uh, these three parameters to illustrate the methodology. And as I said in the earlier video, to be perfectly clear, uh, we're going after to jam. The, the guidance link in the drone. And the reason is because we know where the receiver is for the, for the guidance link. It's on the drone. We don't know exactly where the receiver is for the video link. It's presumably on shore. Some could be some great distance away. Or it could be provided by a repeater drone, which is, you know, like a chase plane drone following the, uh, the uh, surface drone. But in any case, we're going to jam the control link. And the reason is that as the drone gets closer to the ship, as it gets closer to completing its mission, the, j the jammer power from the ship into the drone's receiver is becoming greater. And at the same time, most likely, the control signal from the operator is getting weaker because the drone is getting closer to the ship and probably farther away from the operator. So that's why, for illustration purposes, we want to go after the, the control link. Now, um, I'll just preface this, this video by saying this is not the last word in the methodology. For brevity, I'm leaving out nuances and technical details uh, just to illustrate the methodology. And at the end of the day, there's always some customization that has to happen with the methodology. But in the broad strokes, this is what I would do if asked to design, uh, pick those three things for uh, ship defense against drone attack. And there are nine steps, and here they are. So here are the steps I'd follow. And, and this isn't the last word. It just want to illustrate the principles. Okay, step one. Define the nominal attack scenario and parameter variabilities. We're going to do a bunch of simulations, so we've got to specify what, what, what numbers do we use for the attack. And every parameter in, in, that we're going to specify has to be assigned a nominal value and a variability. And here are the parameters I'd, I'd use, I'd, I'd choose for this kind of a problem. Number one, jammer transmitter power. Number two, jammer antenna gain and height above the mean sea surface. Three, drone receive antenna gain and height. Four, the operator's transmitter power. That's the power of the transmitter that sends the control signal to the drone. Five, the operator's transmit antenna gain and height. Six, the uh, engagement start range. Seven, the jamming to signal ratio in the drone receiver that blocks the guidance signals. That's a threshold I mentioned before. Eight, the ship physical size, because we have to be able to distinguish hits from misses. Nine, the radio, radio link frequency. So for a commercial off-the-shelf video link, that would be, let's say, 2.4 gigahertz or 5.8 gigahertz, give or take. It might be using either or both. Ten is wind speed, which determines the sea surface roughness. Um, and uh, that determines the propagate, how deep the propagation nulls are, so that's why that's important. Eleven is sea swell characteristics. If you have a sea swell model, which I do, uh, that that's you know too much for this video. But I made a video about this before in mean, propagation. Um, anyway, sea swells are specified by amplitude, wavelength, and period. The twelfth is a mathematically we have to mathematically specify a band limited random heading process to represent the effect of surface waves on the drone head on the on the drone's heading when it's not guided. And thirteen is two other propagation parameters that I'm not going to explain here because it's too hard for me to figure out what they are. And collectively, I'll call them parameter X. And and, and they, they, their intention is they make the propagation look realistic. So. That's the list. Let's assume that the, all the jammer uh, power goes into the drone's receiver, so we don't need to worry about the spectrum, at least for now. And the software needs a propagation model that has been validated against experimental measurements, uh, one that actually represents propagation over the sea surface, like confirmed by experimental measurements. And that's possible. 
Step two is to design the population of simulation runs. Okay, we have to figure out, we're going to do a whole bunch of simulation runs and then we're going to do a statistical analysis of them to get our answers. So we have to figure out the required population size for the desired accuracy and confidence of the final result that, that, that we want to have the, the accuracy and confidence. For example, maybe we want uh, the mean miss distance to an accuracy of plus or minus 5% at 95% confidence. Now, this is surprisingly easy and intuitive to do, but including it as a d d detailed explanation how to do that is, is going to bog this video down more than it already is. It's already going to be too long. So uh, we're not done step two yet. We need eight populations of runs, one for all the possible combinations of the following conditions. We need two propagation models. So let's say a simple curved earth model and a sea swell model. And we need two values of wind speed, let's say zero meters per second and let's say 10 meters per second. You can have more, I'm just proposing two. Uh, and two paired values of what I'll call parameter X for realistic propagation. And two cubed makes eight populations. Finally, and this is really important, we have to assign a probability of incur occurrence, in quotation marks, prob probability of occurrence for each of the eight populations. This is the likelihood that the conditions of each population will be observed in the real world. Now, they might all be equally likely, or if the ship is operating in littoral waters, maybe sea swells are unlikely. Or maybe one wind speed is more likely than another at a particular time of year or location. I mean, ultimately, we are going, ultimately we're going to calculate the probability of drone miss and drone miss distance statistics for an ensemble of all eight populations, which means runs in each population have to be weighted by the likelihood that, that conditions for that population will occur. They might not all be equally likely. And pretty obviously, the sum of all those probabilities of occurrences has to add up to 1.0. Okay, step three, dry run population. We have to generate a popula populations, eight populations of, let's say, let's say 500 runs in which there is no jamming. This step is a sanity check to demonstrate the probability of a successful drone attack. If the drones can't hit the ship when the jamming is absent or hit it often enough, something needs to be fixed before proceeding. It could be a software error, or maybe the attack scenarios aren't uh, su sufficiently real realistic. In any case, each run is different. Each simulation run in each population is different. The value of each parameter is randomly assigned at runtime based on the nominal value of that parameter and its allowed variability. We use a random number generator. Uh, use either a Gaussian or a normal probability density function, depending on which those or whatever one you think uh, best represents the distribution of the particular parameter. And just to hit it one more time, I'm talking about randomizing every single parameter in the simulation that isn't known with absolute moral certainty. So that's every parameter. There is nothing we know with absolute certainty, not even the characteristics of our own equipment. Step four, use a custom software application to tabulate hits and misses. You can't do it by hand. It's too many thousands of runs. Calculate the probability of a miss and the mean and standard deviation of the miss distance relative to the bow and stern of the ship for several different ship headings. The, the variation in ship heading is important because the probability of a miss is based on the projected width of the ship. End on aspect is harder to hit for a drone than in a broadside uh, aspect. Now based on these results for the dry run populations, all eight of them, Decide if the probability of a drone success is likely to represent real-world attacks. And remember that the real-world probability of success is not 100%. Not every drone is going to succeed. And, and substantiation for the decision to proceed with the, you know, the, the, the dry run results were good enough, well, that could be uh, provided by an experiment or could be provided by operations research methods. Anyway, if the dry run populations do not match expectations, then it's back to the drawing board with the software and the process has to be repeated until the generation of the uh, uh, dry run populations has to be repeated until they do match expectations. Now this is essential because the improvement that caused by ECM strongly rests on the believability of the dry run populations. And since the methodology always produces a result, 
the believability of the final result, oddly enough, rests strongly on the, on the dry run population. So that has to be right. Otherwise, to proceed without that step is a complete waste of time because the answer is not believable.